save yourself. Makes me think of maybe what happened on the night of the Titanic. People were probably screaming that, especially to their spouses and children. Save yourself. I don't know. But I've read that someplace. We believe in being prepared for events that might come into our lives. There are those folks who are considered preppers. They, they do all kinds of preparation uh, to prepare for all kinds of things. Those are some of the things that people prep for. Power outages. Snowstorms, especially in Florida. Hurricanes, especially in Florida. Tornadoes, earthquakes, all the things that you see there on the list. Riots, financial collapse, civil unrest, tight times, and of course, pandemics. We've all been preppers for that. So I know that you're probably prepared for this. If you're not, you can be prepared this morning. <clears throat> and then I do have, have some of these. these if, if some of you feel like you're unprepared for the future pandemic, <laughs> I'm not really a prepper, <laughs> but a hoarder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's They're nothing not wrong with being prepared. prepared. Absolutely nothing wrong with being prepared. It's interesting we can't prepare for everything that comes along. In Isaiah chapter 47, we learn some insights from Babylon, from the things that God brought into Babylon's life. Babylon uh, sought to be her own deliverer in the ancient world. If you look at Isaiah 47, you'll see that. Uh, this entire chapter, uh, there's a lot of things to say about Babylon. And only uh, one and a half of the verses in this chapter deal uh, really specifically with God's redemption of the children of Israel. There's no redemption for Babylon. Babylon had no uh, redeemer. Babylon sought uh, to deliver and to protect herself. That's what she sought. And, uh, but she had no deliverer of her own. But she sought self-deliverance. She was a prepper. That's what Babylon was. She was a prepper. And I'm going to look at some of the text here with you. I want to read to you beginning verse 1 of chapter 47. And I encourage you to read this entire chapter later in the day and think about some of the things that I've suggested to help you to understand a little more of this chapter. It says in verse 1, Come down and sit in the dust, speaking of Babylon. He calls Babylon, O virgin daughter of Bab Babylon. A virgin daughter, sit on the ground without a throne. So this is uh, the demise of Babylon, of the destruction of Babylon that's being talked about here in these first three verses. O daughter of the Chaldeans, another word for Babylonians, for you shall no longer be called under uh, tender and delicate. Now she's going to face judgment. Take the millstones and grind mill. Remove your veil. Strip off the skirt. All these things were happening in the degradation, if you will, in the destruction of Babylon. Verse 3, your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame also will be exposed. So all the things that he talks about in this text, with the exception of a verse and a half, deal with Babylon. Deal with the destruction that comes upon Babylon and the fact that Babylon is not protected. But Babylon seeks to have a self-protection of herself. She, 
she rests in her own power in this text. As you, as you look at the text, you'll see that she uh, rested in her own power. In verse 7, uh, the, the Scripture says, Yet you said, I will be queen forever. She thought that she, in, in the uh, ancient days, nations, kingdoms, uh, were referred to as she. Uh, in our present day, um, many, many nations are called she. Um, the motherland. There's only one land that I know that calls it a father, and that's Germany, the fatherland, the Vaterland. And, but she is the Babylonian Empire, and she was the queen, verse 7, forever. She was in her own strength. She, she was a self-determined queen and no one was able to destroy her. And of course, that's why he uses the term virgin of her in this text. Is that at the time of this writing, she had not, this prophecy, she had not been captured or taken captivity or uh, destroyed as a country. Until this point, she's going to be, according to this prophecy. She was assured, if you will, of herself. She had self-assurance and self-confidence. There's two verses, verse 8 and 10, uh, which use the personal pronoun I am uh, to, if you look at verse 8, then you look at verse 10 and verse 8, the Scripture says, this is what, this kingdom says, this is what she says in her heart, I am. And she's not comparing herself to Yahweh or to I am that the Lord G, that the Lord Himself calls Himself I am that I am. It's a different word. This is a personal pronoun. This isn't uh, showing that she's in competition with the God of Heaven, though she might feel that she's above the God of Heaven. I don't know. But she makes the statement here personified in verse 8 that she is the I am, she is an I am and there is no one besides her. She is the greatest. She has this wonderful self-confidence and self-assurance. And nations sometimes do that. And this, this nation of Babylon uh, can be used as an illustration, if you will, of what happens to nations uh, who uh, are rooted in their own power and are rooted in their own self-assurance and self-confidence. This can bring deadly results in their life because self-determination is not the source of real power. Even this nation of Babylon there was a power behind that power. And his name is spelled L O R D. It's pronounced Jehovah. He is the God of Israel. And even though this was a wicked nation, this wicked nation could not survive without the power of God and didn't realize it. In fact, the power of God would bring this nation down. The power of God allowed the nation to thrive and allowed this nation to actually be the judge and the punisher of God's people as you'll see in this text. I encourage you to look and you'll see that beginning in verses 6 and following. We'll talk about maybe some of that as well. So her self-deliverance was rooted in her self-assurance and her self-confidence. I am, there is no one besides me. Verse 10, I am and there is no one besides me. And we talked about this a little in Sunday school. This phrase is put in there by Isaiah under the guidance of the Holy Spirit as he gave Isaiah his word. And it compares, if you will, to chapter 43, 44, 45, and 46 where God tells us there is no one like Jehovah. Amen. 
Now, this king had in their mind with self-confidence, with self-assurance, and with its own power that it didn't have to respond to it. There's no one beside her. You see that in the text? And so Babylon uh, sought to be her own redeemer, her own protector, her own deliverer in the ancient world because of the power that she had, because of the self-assurance that she had, and the self-confidence. In verse 10, the Scripture tells us that her deliverance was rooted in her own wisdom and knowledge. And that, that's how the world is today, too. <laughs> the world thinks it's got it all under control. The world thinks it's got it all figured out. This nation thought that too. These are some of the characteristics that can be applied to the world in which we live. They trust power. They are overconfident. They are assured in themselves. And they're wise beyond their true wisdom. <laughs> I like that. Notice what he says in verse 10. He says, You felt secure in your wickedness. No one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge, they have led you astray. So they thought that their wisdom and knowledge was what set them apart and set them above all others. <laughs> but in reality, it was the thing that led them astray because they weren't wise in the Lord God. They weren't wise in the God of heaven. They weren't wise in the Lord of hosts. They weren't wise in the One who could redeem folks. They weren't wise in Him. They were wise in themselves, in their own God and their own things that they trust in. We'll see more of that as we read. And their wisdom actually led them into great wickedness. And so this, this people sought their own redemption and protection in the ancient world. And it was based upon what they thought was and perceived was their great power, their self-assurance, and their self-confidence, and their wisdom and their knowledge, which would lead to great wickedness. And you can read in this text, I encourage you to read in it, you can see all the great points, and I probably shouldn't use the word great, but all the significant points which deal with the types of wickedness that was in that nation. Very wicked people. And wickedness does not lead one to righteousness. The Bible actually says that. Uh, that wickedness is not something that produces righteousness. Verse 6 says, I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage, talking about the people of Israel, and handed them over to you. You did not show mercy to them. On the, on the aged, you made your yoke very heavy. This group of people, though they were used to punish God's children, they used a heavier hand than what God wanted them to use. He wanted punishment, yes. He wanted them to change, yes. But He wanted mercy shown. And these folks were not merciful to God's people at all. They were extremely wicked. Then as you continue to look at this text, her self-deliverance or her protector was her worship. For worship. And you'll see this beginning in verse 12. There was all kinds of things that uh, this nation was involved in relationship to worship. And, in, and this was part of their confidence. This is what they was part of what they thought was their power. This is what was part of what they thought was their wisdom. This was part of what they thought for would produce the kind of people they should be which turned out to be wicked people. 
And so it was all part and parcel connected with their worship system. Notice what it says in verse 12. He says, persist now in your spells and in your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you will be able to benefit. Now, kind of tongue-in-cheek, if you will, maybe sarcasm, if you will, because God knows something that lots of nations don't know. And that is, is that there's no benefit apart from the Lord God of hosts, apart from the Redeemer of heaven and earth, apart from the God who is the Holy One of Israel. There is no benefit in any worship outside of Him. Amen? Notice what he says, continuing in verse 12. Perhaps you will be able to benefit. Perhaps you may cause trembling. So you continue to do the things that you're doing. People may be afraid of you because of the power of the objects of your worship. And if he were speaking the way we speak today, he would conclude that statement with, not... Perhaps you may cause trembling. Not. Perhaps you may have benefit. Not. We know that, don't we? Amen. Verse 13. You are wearied with your many counsels. Remember the Magi? The Magi sourced from Chaldea. Sourced from Babylon. They were wise guys. They were these kind of counselors who were the ones who gave advice to the rulers of the people of Babylon. And so that's part of who he's talking about here, the wise guys. You're wearied with many wise guys, with many counselors. Let now the astrologers and those who prophesy by the stars those who predict by the new moons. <laughs> Tongue in cheek, all of this, because God knows that there is no redemption. There is no power in the worship of any of these things. And that's strong. That's a strong message. This nation, Babylon, sought to be her own deliverer. In the ancient world where she was, she was dependent upon herself. She was not related to God, to the Lord God of Israel. She had no relationship with Him. She was rooted in her own power. She was rooted in her own self-assurance and her self-confidence. She was rooted in her own wisdom and her own knowledge. Uh, she was rooted in her wickedness and she was rooted in the worship system that she clung to to bring success and to bring benefit to her and to cause fear and the ability to conquer peoples. This what she was committed to, connected to. This was for her deliverance. So in the midst of this conversation, there is a hallelujah chorus that takes place. The word hallelujah isn't used. And the Scripture doesn't tell us it was a hallelujah chorus. But in the middle of this conversation about this self-determined, self-confident, self-powerful, wicked kingdom that had no in the midst of all that, verse 4 comes into play. In verse 4, we find out that, that the people of Babylon uh, did not have a redeemer. Babylon was unable to save. And secondly, was unable to stand against the Lord. But... Israel, who could not redeem herself, just like Babel, who could not redeem herself, 
Israel could not redeem herself. But Israel had a God and has a God who is her redeemer. In the last part of verse 3, he says this, I will take vengeance and will not spare anyone. He's speaking to Babylon. Who is this speaking? Our Redeemer. The Lord of armies is His name. They, had, they were better singers than me. This is the Hallelujah Chorus. Isaiah is writing this. In the midst of this, he says, they have no hope. But baby, we have hope. We have hope. We have a Redeemer. He is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of armies. He is the Holy One of Israel. Oh my. This is what's happening in this text. In the midst of all this dastardly things that are happening to this wicked nation, of Babylon, of the Babylonian Empire, of Chaldea, the great God of heaven is a redeemer for His people. Isn't that wonderful to think about? I know the song wasn't very good, but Mr. Fred will come up with one that will be better one day. Amen? But the point is, that they had a Redeemer. And we see it in this text. There is no one to save Babylon. There's no one to save Babylon. But there's someone who is able and willing to save Israel. He is the, the ruler of the universe. This one. He is the ruler of the universe. And the key to this entire chapter is the concept of redemption, which Israel is able to experience. Babylon is not able to experience it. You see, they don't have a relationship with the Lord God of heaven. They don't have a relationship with the Redeemer they don't have a relationship with the Holy One of Israel. And it's not because Israel was such a wonderful group of people. It's because God is the Redeemer. And God loved Israel and was their Redeemer. And it was all a work on His behalf and not on their part. This redemption was not because of them. He is the ruler of the universe. He is the Lord of armies. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the Holy One of Israel who is set apart high and lifted up apart from sinful Israel. Apart from sinful man. This is the Holy One. Who is this Redeemer? It is the God of heaven. What is redemption all about in the Old Testament? What does that word redemption mean? It means to be rescued, or to be delivered. That's what it means. The word redemption is a key word not only in the 47th chapter of Isaiah, but it is a key word in Isaiah chapter 40 through Isaiah chapter 66. The word redeemer is used 13 times in those verses. The word redemption and redeemer are used 26 times in the book of Isaiah, in the entire book of Isaiah. You know, the word redemption and redeemer is used less than 70 times in the entire Old Testament. Over half of them are in this book of Isaiah. Redemption and redeemer is an important key not only to this chapter, but to the entire book. And so this chapter teaches us something really significant about this One who is the Redeemer. The first thing that I want you to know about the Redeemer... Let's see if I've got it up here. Nope, I didn't put it up there. The, the Redeemer in this text is the Lord God 
of armies. Okay? He is the Redeemer. The word for Redeemer or redemption is the word G-A-A-L. Some spell it G-A-E-L. Gale. Okay? I don't know how you really pronounce it, but people pronounce it all kinds of, things, all kinds of ways. But this is the word. It's a very special word uh, for Redeemer. This one who is the Redeemer must have a personal family relationship with the person that's going to be redeemed. The God of heaven, our Father in heaven, had a special personal relationship with Israel. He was her father. Amen? Didn't have that relationship with Babylon. Now, Babylon could uh, become a part through all kinds of ways, become a part of Israel individually. They could have, you understand all that. But God was closely related to Israel. He was her father. And so he had this personal relationship. You have to, to be a redeemer, you have to have a personal relationship or a personal family connection with the person who needs to be redeemed. And so God had that personal family connection with Israel. The second thing a Redeemer has to have is the Redeemer must have the ability to pay the price for the redemption. In the case of the redemption of Israel, God had the resources to pay the price. And then, God had, or the Redeemer, had to have the willingness to purchase the one to be redeemed. Amen? And so, Lord God is the Redeemer. In fact, He tells us in this text, look again with me in verse 3. I will take vengeance and will not spare anyone. Our Gaal. The Lord of armies is His name. Have you heard of the avenger of blood? That's what a Gaal was. A Gaal wasn't just someone who was next to kin, but it was someone who could avenge the death of a kinsman. And there was only one person who could do it. It was the Gaal. It was the next of kin. And so the Lord God of heaven was the next of kin of Israel. And He was the only one who could avenge what happened to Israel. Amen? And so that's this context so that you understand. So the great God of heaven is an illustration, if you will, of the kinsman redeemer. The Lord is the kinsman Redeemer. There are two major kinsmen redeemers in the Bible. I don't know that I have it up there. There are two major people in the Bible who are kinsmen redeemers. One is Boaz. He redeemed Ruth. And the other is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ is our kinsman redeemer. You know, you can't redeem yourself. You can't do it. There's people like living in the world who think that they can. Well, it's all going to work out for me. I'm a pretty good dude. Or, you know, I don't understand all that stuff. I'm just going to live. And we'll see where, the, where everything falls. There is a Redeemer. A kinsman who is a Redeemer who came to this earth to be your 
can be redeemed if you trust Him. And you don't have to be of Israel. You don't have to be of Babylon. You can be of any nation, any nationality, anyone upon the face of the earth can come to this their kinsman. You see, the reason that the Lord Jesus took on human flesh was to become kin to you. He's your kinsman. He's your kinsman, which is kind of cool. Thank you. He's your kinsman. He came here to get, get in your family and in my family. He's, he's our near kinsman. The Lord Jesus is. He's our near relative. He, he is. He's related to us. He took on human flesh to dwell among us, to become related to you and me so that He could pay the price of your sin. You see, He's the only one who could pay that price. It was a price that can't be bought with money, can't be bought with favor, can't be bought with goodness. It was a price that demanded the life of the perfect sacrifice from all eternity the very Son of God. And so the Lord Jesus, He became your relative, your near, near kin, so He could pay our price. And it was a huge price. That only He could pay that price. No one else could die for you. No one else could die for me. No one else could have the price to pay the ransom so that I could have eternal life. And so He had the ability to pay the price. But then He was also willing to pay the price. The Lord Jesus Christ was willing to pay the price for you and me. He laid down His life on that cross willingly. Amen. Willingly He did it. That's what the kinsman redeemer would have to do. He would have to be kin, next of kin. He would have to have the resources to be able to redeem. And He would have to be willing to do it. Jesus Christ willing to He is our kinsman redeemer. So as we look at the redeemer of Israel, He is a foreshadow of your redeemer and my redeemer. We're redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. If you never trusted Him, he is your kinsman this morning. You've never trusted Him. He is your kinsman. He's paid the full price for you. He did it willingly. He asked you to trust Him. I encourage you. If you never trust Him, trust Him with your soul. I'm not a prepper. I do have some things here that if we have to go back to mask and we have to start doing our hands... Unless this is all stale. Then. Anyway, I, I've got some of that stuff. It's not like the Patriot stuff they sell that has 25 year CIA. I don't know what the shit this is. But I'm not a prepper in a lot of those things. I know lots of preppers. You may be doing some prepping too. Occasionally, I do practice prepping. My wife doesn't like it. She thinks we have enough tuna fish in the house already. You see, I think that that is the, the food that will keep you alive is tuna fish. <laughs> and onions. Amen. <laughs> she will tell me. She will tell me. She doesn't use the word prepper, but I know what she says. 
she's looking at me. She doesn't call me prepper or preppy or anything like that. But she looks at me and she says, we have enough toothbrush. And my stock answer, because I'm getting harder to hear, is you say we need more tuna fish, dear? She goes, absolutely not. And she gets dramatic and she throws the tuna fish out. This week she told me something else. I don't remember what it was. But, but I go out and I buy these things because I am in my heart a prepper but not a prepper like the world preps. See, my confidence is, is not in all the things I can put in my closets. Even though I should have some things in my closets, like I should have batteries, you know, hurricane season. I should have some water. I, I should put stuff on the windows. See, that's all prepper stuff, right? But there's one thing that... I want to really be prepped about. And that is an eternal prep. Amen? I want to be an eternal prep. A prepper who trusts the Lord Jesus for my salvation. Join me to become an eternal prepper if you're not. Father, we love you. We thank you for your wonderful word. We thank you, Lord, for these texts which teach us things that, that we wouldn't know if they weren't in your word. We pray, Lord, that you help us to rightfully handle your word and that you would help us as we think about the wonderful truth that in the midst of the world, the world has its way. But you have a way that leads to salvation. And so, Father, we thank you for this your word this morning. In our Savior's name. Amen. There's one other